All right, welcome back, everybody. It's my honor to introduce our next speaker for the Trayline Conference, uh, Stan Weinstein himself. Uh, Stan, it's great to have you here. Uh, obviously, the author of Secrets for Profiting in Bull and Bear Markets and uh, a market legend. So, Stan, always great chatting with you, and thank you so much for taking the time uh, to speak with you today. It's my pleasure, and I got to tell you, I don't want this to sound cliche, but the timing, you know, that old cliche of the market timing is everything. The timing is great because we've got such a dichotomy here where the fundamentalists on TV, they come on the business channel, they're telling us at the minimum, we're going to go back and test the October lows. We're going to, some think we're going to break the lows. I'm not saying forever that can't happen, but it's not happening now. No way. And anybody who's been following us knows that. So it's very timely. And the other thing that I think is great, we're in, and we're going to talk about this in detail. We're in a very amazing period where I don't even want to get involved with, are you in a bull market or bear market? Instead, we're in a neutral market. And this is where the work is so powerful because a lot of the stage one and twos are flying. They're bullish. At the right. same time, a lot of my stage threes and fours have had accidents, to put it quietly and nicely. So this is a great time to be talking. Yeah, for sure. I'm excited to get into it and I know we're going to go through a bunch of charts but uh, first kind of starting high level I'd love to hear your take on you know what the health of the market is from your perspective you know what are the trends from short term to longer term and maybe a little bit about how you how you personally decide that sure at first and I'm not going to dodge the question but I'm going to tell you and everybody who's watching there are times where the market is really the end all and be all there are other times where it's really stock picking. This is stock picking time because I've seen so many people who say we're in a bull market and it's going to new highs. And other people say we're a bear market, it's going to crash. And I think that's not relevant. What's relevant is to know, and people again who follow us know that we put out that bear market sell signal in January of 2022. It crashed you in a clear bear market into that mid October bottom. Then once we put that bottom in and we always move incrementally. I'm not going to lie and say, oh, I knew at that point how good it was going to be, but we covered a load of shorts, knew it was an important short-term bottom. It then drifted into an intermediate-term bottom. And since then, I think you've basically been in a neutral bull bear market. Mm -hmm. So don't get hung up. I can't stress this too strongly. Don't get hung up in semantics. You're in a bull market, you're in a bear market. Know that all you have to do is look, we have by proprietary S&P and secondary surveys, they're currently both near 50%. That means half of the stocks are bullish, and obviously those are the ones you want to buy, and half are negative, and you can very easily step into a pothole. So, you know, we all have egos, but I kind of like this kind of market because I'm watching people, especially the fundamentalists, get destroyed here, while at the same time, and even some technicians are missing it, you have to know you're in a neutral market and it sounds cliche, but what I say in my updates is what's good is good and bad is bad and it's working on both sides. So I really think this is kind of exciting and very few people are able to do it, but we're going to teach everybody here how they can do it. For sure. And, you know, the, the last kind of public interview we did, it was, you know, before the bear market that we had. Uh, what's kind of the outlook now that we've gone through that and, and moved off the bottom now? Is the longer term outlook improving? What's what are your kind of thoughts on that? Well, first of all, let's stick with the intermediate term. Sure. It's improved, no doubt. And for months, anybody that follows us know that. But I think it's a mistake to look too far out. There are times that the market is clearly bullish. We're not clearly long term bullish here. Um, a perfect example, after we went through that late 2007 into the March, April 2009 bottom, that bear market cleaned everything out. Right. And that's, you know, anybody can make more money after that if you were in gear with the bull market. And that's why they say, don't confuse brains in a bull market. That was easy. This is challenging. And I like the challenge. And I think this is what we can bring to all the people that we're working with here. They can meet the challenge too. It really isn't that difficult. Um, as long as they don't listen to the garbage that's on so many of the business news channels. In fact, I kid around with clients who will tell me, oh, I just saw that on this channel, and that channel. So the way to watch the business news channel is to leave the picture on and shut off the sound. 
There you go. There you go. Just listen to the tape. That's what we got to be listening to. Absolutely. Remember, I had that on top of every issue of the professional tape reader. The tape tells all. For sure. And getting into the, the recent action, what have been some of the leading groups and themes that have been working? And maybe also we'll touch on some of the laggards as well. That's so important. This market is so sector as well as stock oriented. Yeah. Um, it's even more so than in the old days. And again, I can only guess why, um, but I, I think now with all the computer programs, whatever, when we like a group for argument's sake, we've liked um, biotechnology. Not everyone, but almost every biotechnology stock, especially a small stage one and twos, have done very, very well. We liked a lot of other healthcare too. In addition, um, a lot of select technology stocks after getting cleaned out, they've been the leaders. That's good. So that's another fine area to do. At the same time, there's plenty of stage three and four stocks that we want to stay far away from. But this is a very, very challenging time. And interestingly enough, up until recently, and this we're talking now on a Thursday night, what's the date here? June 8th. Yep. Um, the Russell 2000 index, as we've been writing, up until a couple of days ago, had been the weak sister. Right. It had been lagging, whatever, big time. Now, even the Russell has broken out above its 150 and 200-day moving averages, and it already had broken above the 50-day MA. And now, in the last several days, it's very interesting, the Russell is actually outpacing now the go-go stocks, which had been the ones that had been the leadership before. So... This, again, remains a wild, wild market. And this is why I really want to spend less time talking about the long term, focus more on the intermediate term. The short term will be for hotshot traders, but really the sweet spot is the intermediate term the next several weeks. It's been that way since the October bottom, and I don't see it changing for at least the next several weeks. So as long as you stick with the good stage one and twos, I feel like a kid in a candy store. I can't buy them all. Yeah, perfect. And speaking of themes and, and groups that have been working, uh, does the AI theme, is that something that you're focused on? Obviously, the semiconductors have been super strong. What are your kind of thoughts on all, all yeah, this, this move. We, well, you just named it. Within the technology sector, the AI, very strong. We had uh, so many of those semiconductors, um, the, the wireless, all the stuff, tremendous. Um, but even some now, they're getting around to some of the small tech stocks. And in fact, you know, this is where the work comes in so handy. If you find any chart that got destroyed, say in the last year to year and a half and then it came down made a stage one base pattern and it's not going to go back to those prior highs of a year and a half two years ago but a lot of these stocks i think they have the potential to double and they'll still be down 50 60 percent from their peaks right. so find a base in a stock that's been destroyed and moved into stage 2a early in the you know if the, the early basing phase it breaks out into stage 2a that's where you want to be because your risk reward is so terrific at that time. Yeah, for sure. And I wanted to touch on a little bit your thoughts on the market breadth because a lot of people were pointing out, you know, for the majority of this rally, it's been concentrated in the big caps and tech and all of that. But as you pointed out just now, the Russell has been kind of playing catch up. What are your kind of thoughts on the big caps really leading off the bottom, but now we're seeing it maybe increase and improve a little bit? You, as I love working with you because you always lead good to good places. First of all, on the surface, if you just do it simple-mindedly, a lot of people are concerned. I was even a little bit concerned. When I turned bearish in the late 2021 period, in the, the November, December, you had the go-go stocks going, but almost nothing else was going. And that added to our call in early January of the bear market. Now you had to a degree somewhat a similar thing until recently, but now that the Russell has come on and broken out, I don't think, this is why I'm saying for the next several weeks, probably a couple of months, we may get into trouble down the road. I'm not saying that won't happen, but for the next several weeks, 
the fact that the Russell is now broken out, it's broadening the rally, right. which is the opposite of what actually happened back in late 2021, early 2022, when it was only the go-go stocks and nothing else. So I think that this is a healthy thing. But again, going back to your advanced decline talk, even today on this Thursday, again, June 8th, you take a look today on the surface, oh, it was a terrific rally. That was up almost 170 points. But go and take a look at the advanced decline and it was even Stephen on both the New York and OTC markets. So this reinforces what our game plan has been, which is don't get caught up again in the bull bear stuff. Understand this is a stock selective market. Yep. And here's where the work really helps us. Yeah, perfect. And you mentioned the advanced decline lines. Uh, what other kind of market indicators have you been taking a look at uh, throughout the rally this year that's kind of helped you, you know, c- confirm the strength, the, the potential for, for positive movement? Well, first of all, we always go back and it's not because of pride of ownership, but way back in the early 70s, we developed the S&P and secondary surveys, which just show it's like doing a subsurface X-ray of the market. And the fact that both our S&P and secondary surveys are in a, basically a 50-50 position, that to me speaks reams about what this market is all about at this point. You have a one in two chance of stepping into a pothole very easily, but not if you follow the discipline. Mm -hmm. So that's one. In the meantime, at least they've gotten to the point where they're neutral, that's okay, but it certainly isn't like I said, when you came out of that bottom in 2009. Other indicators we look at, um, which have been very helpful, all of the stock, all the leading indicators, um, the leading gauges above their 200 day, 150 and 200 day moving averages. So that's also bullish, but again, tempering things, the number of new highs, well, last several days have been more new highs than new lows, are still kind of anemic. So again, this is each thing that comes out, checks the box off and tells us, even though I sound like I'm repeating it over and over, but at Northland, you can't make it too strong. Don't get hung up on bull bear thesis. Don't overthink things. Instead, just focus on some of these great stocks which are bullish. And then look at the charts. And we're going to do this for them. Um, Look at the charts that are clearly bearish. And I don't care how beautiful the fundamentals are and who's pushing that stock. As long as you're in stages three and four, stay far away from it. If you follow this discipline, I'm not going to tell you, oh, it's any system is 100% foolproof. That's for liars. But the reality is if you're disciplined and you follow what we're going to teach them here, eight out of 10 times, you're going to be on the right side of the market and the right side of stocks. And I always come back. Some people get annoyed with this because they say, oh, how can you liken um, the market to blackjack? But I think it's like blackjack. Anybody out there who plays blackjack knows that you don't overthink things. If you've got 11, the deal has got a six. That's the best hand you can have. You automatically double down and you may lose that hand. But in the great majority of cases, you're going to win. Well, it's the same thing in the market. If you stay away from stage three and four, and you especially buy 2A, which is after you've had the big base, and then your first break out of the base, I'm telling you, at the end of the year, you'll win and all you'll need is a creative accountant. There you go. I love that. And keep it simple. Definitely important to remember. Definitely. And, and, and that's another thing. People always say to me, Stan, what is one of the biggest mistakes that people make in the market? I think it's overthinking things. And I'll be honest, especially in my younger days, I did it too. I mean, you start looking about, well, what the, the market indicator is saying this. Um, I don't know if I should buy that stock. If you learn to keep it simple, you'll see, and you don't overthink things. Again, nothing is perfect. You're not going to always be right. But this is something I'm very proud of. In my book that I wrote, God, I think about 35 years ago, whereas I remember reading some books, how I made $2 million in 22 minutes, et cetera, et cetera. I put a chapter in there about stocks that didn't work. And I really believe what I wrote 35 years ago is still valid today, which is that how you handle a losing position is going to make you a winner in the market. No matter what system you use, there's going to be some clinkers come along, but it's how you deal with those losers and you make it up the next time that's going to make you a winner. 
Yeah, one hundred percent. And and I want to ask you: Was there kind of an aha moment where that really clicked, where you really realized that you had to focus on limiting the losers and cutting those, and that was kind of the ultimate secret to over time have an edge in the markets? A absolutely. And that's what the journey is all about. But Richard, this is where we can help them because hey, nobody was there initially to help me. I had to make the mistakes, but I think one of my strengths is like people say nice things. Oh, Stan, you're a genius. I'm not a genius. But uh, what I am, and I, I'll be, I'm proud of this, I think is one of the most disciplined market players that you'll ever find. I know what my rules are. I never say, well, maybe this time it's different. To me, again, it comes down to the blackjack thing. I don't overthink the 11 versus deal of six, and I don't overthink a stock is breaking out of a stage one base. It's in a good group. Volume's coming in. Go for it. Perfect. And I, I think one more question before uh, we're going to move on to charts. You know, going through all the market cycles that you have, have had, um, does the current environment remind you of a particular transition period after bear market? You mentioned 2008, 2009, but are there any others that really stand out where the similarities are really glaring? No, th really, this is different. Mm -hmm. This is very, very different, which is why I don't think it's going to be like it was after that bear market, which was vicious. It really started, if you go back in the chart, in the summer of 2007 and ended when we get, got that very important positive divergence in the March-April period of 2009. But they had really cleaned out the entire market and there, it wasn't an accident that you moved up nicely for a couple of years. I don't think that's the way it is here. This is a trading environment. It's a very, very different market. They didn't clean the whole market out. You can see the fact that Apple recently touched a new all-time high, that's not cleaned out. There are plenty of others like that. Right. So I, I don't think it's the same thing. And probably, and we'll watch it, uh, one of my strengths is not looking too far down the road, but I think in a couple of months, all of these divergences are going to come back to haunt us. And again, I don't want to be eccentric, but over the last 50 plus years, very close to inception, we've caught every bull and bear market, you know, very within 5% of its starting. So I think the same way that when things got really bad in January of 2022 and we blew the whistle, we'll blow the whistle again, but it's not yet ready for that to happen. Yeah, perfect. And I think, uh, you know, my favorite thing to do with you and one of my favorite things is to go through charts and pick your brain and see how you interpret price action. Uh, let, let's go ahead and talk through some of uh, the trades and recommendations from Global Trend Alert. Um, you sent over a list of, of recommendations and we'll also go through some that didn't work. You specifically want to do that, which I think is great. Uh, so let's go ahead and get my screen up here. Give me one second and let me know when that comes up for you. I've got it. Perfect. So uh, first, we've got the QQQ up, uh, but I can go ahead and talk through uh, the winning trades, the stage one and twos that you went over or wherever you'd like to take us. No, this this is terrific. Um, just let, I've got in the middle of this chart, I hope I'm not going to disconnect anything where it says got it. Okay, yeah, I got rid of it. Terrific. Let's And this is, again, everybody out there, again, I like to talk, in analogies because it's a simple way of getting important points across. If, what we're gonna do now, I think is so very important is that old BS about a picture's worth a thousand words, yada, yada, all that stuff. It's true. And another analogy I use is, so, I know some of the people out there in the audience, they're already pretty hip with technicals. Some may not be as much, but I'm gonna say for each person, when let's say you're starting a lesson you've never played tennis. The first thing they'll do, the, the pro is going to hit to you and you think about, is it a forehand? Is it a backhand? And the more balls that are hit to you, after a while you get used to it and you don't stop thinking, is it a forehand and backhand? You just react. Well, it's the same thing with charts. What we're going to do now is give them tennis balls hit at them analogously. And after a while, they're going to see in it it really, some people say, oh, is it really that simple? It really is straightforward. So here we go. Let's take a look. This is the cues. As and, long as and you, Stan, as do you long... mind if I jump in for a second? Just to orient everybody uh, about the chart, 
Uh, this red line is the 50 day moving average. The black line is the 200 day and we've got the 150 day moving average in orange here, just so everybody's clear and, and oriented. Good, you even got me on board. So that, that's terrific. Yeah, now take a look. While it was below the 200 day moving average, sure you had some rallies, but they didn't go anywhere. And now once you moved above the 200 day MA and you had a rally, then you got it. And then look how it came back and tested. It held within a ceiling millimeter of the 200 day and the 150. It took off thereafter. And the cues are clearly in, in a stage two uptrend from that point on. And now if you take a look just from a scalping point of view, and this is because you know we have a lot of traders in the global trend alert. From a scalping point of view, just for a few days, I'm still very bullish on the cues. But it looks like a little baby head and shoulder may be forming here where you had this little right there left, then you went up to a new high right, and then boom, I think it, the burden of proof short term is that the cues have to move to a new high and close above 359. If they fail, it's not the end of the world. It's not going to turn the uh, bearish, but I know there are people that are playing two, three, four day moves. If that happens, I wouldn't short it. But from a trading point of view, I would take some chips off the table, especially on Wednesday. They got clocked pretty good. Um, I had written and anticipated that and said, after the tremendous rally, they had some digesting to do. As it turned out, it was in digestion because they hit them hard on Wednesday. Yeah. And if it doesn't go to a new high, you're going to have a little bit more of consolidating, digesting, whatever. And then... Again, remember, we're, bear we're not bearish on it, but after it does its sideways work, once it closes above 359, it'll run again. So that's very, very important. But the main thing to get across for most people is just see, you didn't, you know, it's really easy when you go through your charts. The whole time it was below 200 day MA, you didn't want to fool around with it. Once it moved above it, not coincidentally, good things happen. Perfect. And I'll bring up the IWM, the Russell, just because we were mentioning that earlier, and we can zoom into the recent action here. Exactly. Now, this is very interesting. So, so many things are coming off of this chart. But if you take a look, just one, two, three, four, five, six, six, seven days, I think it was a week ago, Thursday, if I'm not mistaken, over there, you'll see the Russell, when I'm doing short term trading, I do something called positive and negative divergences. When everything is moving up, that's great. When something gets out of gear, like two averages make new highs, two or three don't confirm, just trading-wise, that's a signal that you're going to get a contra-trend move on the downside. Conversely, you see right there where you have this little doohickey there, it broke to a new reaction low. And at that point, none of the other indexes on that day we wrote about that, broke below their respective lows. That was a positive divergence, which was a favorable short-term indication. We had the traders cover shorts, do some buying, and then take a look and show them about that little gap that came, uh, you got it right there, boom, you had a gap. You not only moved above the 150, but also 200-day moving averages. You had the gap there. It's terrific. Now, short-term, you know, you, you go so quickly from what there where it was down there, 172 and change all the way up to where we are now. It, it's going to probably come in for a few days, but you want to buy the correction coming in, um, e even though it's not an A-plus chart because you do have supply overhead. Look at February, March. But A, it's a trade, that alongside trade. That's number one. B, you, I use this as an indicator. The fact that... That's a very important sign. The fact that the weak sister has even that now come to the fore and starting, that that tells me, and I'm not, I'm not talking for the next two years, but that's telling me for the weeks ahead, you're going to be in, still in a good market, at least a decent market. So that's very, very, very important. Perfect. And I think now we'll come back to, to a few names on here. Uh, but first, let's go ahead and start training our eyes and talking through the charts of the stocks that have been performing well. So, uh, yeah, walk me through. We've got Apple here. Just let me know when you'd like me to go to the next one. And sure, we we'll, go look, ahead. we'll do it again. Here we go. We're hitting tennis balls. Then. 
I want all of you out there, look at it. Just get the feel. See, I can bring you so far mechanically, but the word feel, I put in quotes, that has to be developed. Some people feel things better than others, while well, other people just plot along. They say, that's bullish, that's bearish. We're going to show, I think this is such an important exercise. We're going to try to develop feel in you because feel is important. Take a look. The apple, we had been short the apple. Then boom, you see it came down there and it made that new low. Show them you got it. Now, this was important. At that point, you don't want to buy it. Even if there's a way of knowing that that was the bottom, I never want to buy guessing, oh, that's a bottom. But what then was important, it then made a little baby base there, show them that. Then it didn't, like at other times, fail at the 200-day MA. It moved above the 200-day MA. Then as it pulled back, show them how it pulled back. Yup. As it pulled back, it just broke by a cylinder millimeter there. We again did more buying once it moved back above the 200-day MA. And the rest is history. Now, from a, again, we're mixing a lot of short-term and intermediate together. It's fine. But from a scalping point of view, show them one, two, three, four days ago, it had what I call a key reversal day. Now, this isn't like, oh, it's the end of the stock forever. But if you're a trader, and this is an important thing, let me digress. Um, we have a lot of traders, obviously, in Global Trend Alert. We also have long-term players. But this is what's changed over the years. Whereas in the old days, many years ago, you know, back 30 plus years ago, I wouldn't worry about these short-term foul-ups. Now I do worry about them because the volatility is something that I never saw when I played in the late 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Never saw this. We're living a new norm. So rather than bitching and moaning about it, you've got to know what you're dealing with. So when you get a, a key reversal day like that, and to me, a definition of a key reversal day is the following. First, it makes a new high for the move. It did. Then it not only closes down on the day, but it closes below the low of the prior day. It did. It does this on heavy volume. The volume was heavy. It was. Now you're fooling around on the right side. Again, I'm always flexible. I'm ready to be wrong. I'm not going to be stubborn. But I don't think short term, long term is different. I don't think short term it's going to move above that high. If it doesn't move above the high, it's making a little baby top. And again, I always kid around with clients and say profit taking is not a dirty word. You take some off. And that's really what people have to learn in this market versus 10 to 15 years ago. Even my long term players, they're all anybody who followed me has learned to make incremental moves. Obviously, if you're a trader, you make big moves. But even if you're a long term player, these moves are so vicious, you take a little off. And if it breaks below that low, show them the low of the last three days. If it breaks below that low of the past three days, it's going to come down to that next moving average there, which I believe is the 50-day MA, right, Rich? Yeah. Yep. It's going to come down to there. And you know, at that point, maybe you want to buy it again. But the bottom line is there are certain rules that if you learn, it's going to help you big time. And another thing that people will say to me so often what did you have to do to learn to really become successful in the market? Well, obviously my system, but over and above my system, I learned the key word, which I said before, discipline. I'm totally disciplined. I never argue with my system. The bottom line, when I take a look at the end of the day, if something didn't work and you can, I, and you should do the same thing, can honestly look and say, you checked all the boxes. It did everything it was supposed to do and it didn't work. That's just life. Life and the stock market is not perfect. There'll be, I would say, two out of 10 foul ups, and we'll handle those. Eight out of 10, it will follow the script perfectly. And again, that's what it's all about. So discipline is a key word that I can't overemphasize. Perfect. And because you mentioned the moving averages, and I know this is a question that a lot, a lot of people suggested, um, how, how has your personal trading ad adapted to the current markets, which are faster paced, as you mentioned? Uh, how, how have you incorporated, you know, different moving averages or different method, different styles and added that to your process? Fine. Okay. If we're talking me personally, I, I, and I'm straightforward with everybody. Well, obviously you all see the charts. 
you have to be who you are. I think where Shakespeare said, be true to thine self. The bottom line is, I am, I think, one of the best traders on the street. I'm not as good an investor because when I see something's going to come down 10%, even though it's good, whatever, I'll often kick it out and we'll get it. It's like the next taxi going down the block. I'll get into something else. And, you know, and that's my nature. Um, but the bottom line is, what I've really changed, like I think a good question is, what has changed over the past 30, 40 years, and certainly the last 15, 20 years, and that's whereas before, even somebody like myself, if it's stock broke, it's 50-day moving average, I would kick out at least half. Now, me personally, I'm not telling everybody to do this, me personally, if a stock breaks below 50-day moving average, I'm out. Mm -hmm. There are so many other stocks that don't have any black clouds, I don't need to start riding it, wait for it to go to the hospital and be repaired in the emergency room. I'm out of it. When it comes back, and once in a while you'll get whipsawed, when it comes back and it's healthy again, I'll return to it. So I think that's changed. And even my long-term market players, and this is very important, um, there are very few people, I, I guess you can always find some you know, oddball here and there, but there are very few even long-term market plays, even my mutual fund plays, et cetera, who are really calling me up and saying, Stan, what do you like for the next six to 12 months? That's ancient history right now. That's the way it was 10 years ago. Right now, even my long-term players, two things come. What do you like for this quarter? So that, I think, is a valid question. And the second thing is, even these long-term players, most of them, will, when you break 50-day moving averages, you get reversals, like an Apple, short-term, whatever, will do a little bit of incremental you know, trading and get out, again, not out of the position, but trim it and get out of a bit of it and then look to buy it on a pullback. That's how you deal with this new norm that we're in, which is ridiculous volatility that's been brought about by so, well, you all know, it's been brought about by so many things that have gone on in the marketplace. In the old days, we had specialists with books, and even though we know some of them were a little crooked, they still served a very valid purpose of balancing the books and supply and demand. Now, between commissions being so low, yeah, you can just press a button and buy or sell it, and two hours later, you can reverse your position. This is the way it is, it's the new norm. I don't like it, I think you didn't know how great it was when we're in the 70s and 80s, and I would say even into the early 90s, but those days are gone. They're gone forever. So again, rather than bitching and moaning, we've got to adapt to it. And the way I've adapted is to, if a stock starts to act poorly, even on a short to intermediate term basis, I get out. And again, you can come back and ride it when it gets healthy again. Yeah, perfect. Let's go ahead and run through some more reps here. And I think this might be an interesting chart to, to talk through just because of the price and volume characteristics. Because uh, a question that I think would be great to touch on is uh, what would you look for in terms of price and volume uh, for, you know, the late stage one and on the stage to break out that would make it an A double plus setup? Right. Well, first of all, happily, every one that you're showing them was stocks that we recommended that were winners. So, I, But understand, again, only the liars are 100 percent right. It's like people who go to the racetrack and they show you the winning tickets, you know. And we'll show you some that are negative threes and fours, which were good short sales, and then a couple that looked like they were good buys that didn't work out. But the truth is, again, we're hitting tennis balls to you and trying to show up in your eye. And if you take a look, you'll see each of these why we recommended it, and you'll see how it. First of all had that gap. Gaps are very important. That's a change of psychology and supply and demand. So you had that gap there and then boom, it moved above the 200 day moving average, the 150 and the 200. And look, when it came back down, it held above that long-term MA and the rest is history. Now you had the beautiful rally up. We were terrifically happy. And just from a scalping point of view, note how you had this little double top there Right, right, right. Show them that. By the way, I, I don't know. When I do this, does this show on the screen, Rich, or only? No, I think that's just on your side. Okay, yeah. it's only on yeah. my side. Then you show them. Okay? So you had the little baby double top there, and then you had a sharp down day. 
it's still a fine stock. If you're looking out for the next six, eight weeks, it's fine. But again, this is what I try to inculcate into anybody who's a trader. When you see that kind of little short-term negative action, don't get out, but do a little bit of trimming. And in fact, not only will that pad your profit side of the game, but in addition, psychologically, this is important, psychologically, it'll keep you from making a big mistake because if you sell nothing and then the stock breaks down and comes all the way back, let, let's show them to that first moving average there, that's a pretty hefty decline. And instead of looking to do buying, if it holds there, there, I, and myself it used to happen to, you'll start to panic and sell it when you should be buying it. So psychologically, if you're ready for the decline and you take some off, and then if it holds in textbook fashion, you'll feel psychologically good about buying it again, even though you had to go through that rough patch short term. So that is a case of both helping the profit side of the equation, as well as helping the psychology part of the equation. Perfect. Here's the next one, AVGO. Oh, oh this has been beautiful. Again, now, we, there's an old cliche about trees don't grow to the sky. Okay, and you know what? It's true about stocks too. So we were so happy to recommend this and boom, it took off or whatever. But the bottom line is that it just became a bit too much short term after that crazy move. So again, take a little off trading wise, but looking out over the next six, eight weeks, it's still a fine, fine chart. And I think that there's a good chance it'll, even if it corrects further, it'll hold above that gap. Show them the recent gap. It was right. Yeah, you got it. I think it'll probably hold above that. And most people don't know is an old saying that, oh, gaps have to be covered. But that's not true. I would say historically, from what I've seen, probably about 80 to 85, maybe 90 percent of gaps do get covered where it comes in and it fills the gap. But the 10 to 15 percent that don't get covered, that's fair. And then it starts to rally. That's a very powerful signal. In fact, <laughs> there's still a gap. When I was a young and I started coming to market um, back in 1962, there's a gap on the Dow Jones. I think it was something down around 550, 575 that was never covered. The rest is history. Yeah, perfect. And that is kind of something that over your your career has changed. There, there's a lot more because of earnings and, and how things are disseminated now. How do those kind of come into play in your process and how have you adapted to, to deal with that? Right, you're definitely right. There's many more gaps because now supposedly nobody knows the news, whatever, even though we know somebody sometimes does know it. But the bottom line is all you can do is see how it acts around gaps. First, if it's just strictly a news gap and there's no follow through and it's quickly covered, you can get a trade out of it, but that's not special. But if it's something like this, where you do, this actually had two gaps. Show them there was a little baby gap. You got it down there. And then there was the second follow-up gap the next day or two days later. That's very powerful. And now if we could talk 30 days from now and you say it came in here and it never covered the gap, I think it'll take off and it's going to have another powerhouse move. Perfect. And if you do, if, if you have a position personally in a stock in a strong stage two, uh, it's looking good, but earnings are coming up. How do you personally deal with that situation? Do you sell some at the strength? And, and if it did gap down on you, how would you decide whether to keep holding the position or to let more go? Now that, that's a good question. The bottom line is first, if you know earnings are co coming, and especially if there's air beneath you, I automatically take some off. I just think that's common sense. I, mean, I used to be on the seminar circuit, which I haven't done for years. I used to say common sense is a rare commodity on Wall Street. We all make the game so much harder than it has to be. So you take some off. Then there's no way of knowing before, but here's where evaluation comes in. If after the news, you have first an upside gap and it's not covered, well, that's terrific. If you have a downside gap, I would, I would get out and come back to fight another day. If the news doesn't do anything good or bad, I would just whatever I have, ride it. So just watch how it reacts rather than trying to guess, you know, beforehand, just see what comes out after the news is out. Yep, perfect. All right.
Moving on to the next one here. We got Barnes. Right. Okay. Now this, it, take a look. It had we had a good trade, but t again, take a look and see. It had a terrific move, and then you had this. Show them there where you had that big reversal day, and then it broke the fifty-day moving average. Yeah. I personally got out. We got out of it, and I, I got a lot of traders out, even some of the investors. Breaking below a 50-day MA, to me, is worrisome. And like I said, it's one thing if there was nothing else you could go into. But to me, again, it's common sense that if you get a black cloud and, there, and it drops from what was an A idea to say a B minus or a C, and there are new A's coming along, why the heck wouldn't you get out, take the profit, and boom, then you go into it later on if it gets healthy again. Like, after it's been a long time now, it's built this little base. Show them along here. You can almost make a trend line across these two tops. Mm -hmm. um, if it breaks out above that level, it, you can return to the scene of the crime and do it again. But look at how much agita and time you've wasted if you never got out when it broke the 50 day MA. Perfect. And what was the buy point for this one? Where were you looking it to came, enter? Right, right here when it came above. It's long term MA. The the one fifty day right here or further here with the two hundred. The two hundred. The two hundred, yeah. Okay. Perfect. And that lines up with this this resistance level right here. Exactly. Very good. Perfect. All right, moving on. We got BLDR. This has been a super strong. Oh, absolutely. Now this is another case of the group being, you know, uh, very helpful. If you take a look, you'll see from when it broke out way back there, I think it was January, late January, early February. This is a thing of beauty, a joy to behold. Look at how every correction held above the rising 50 day MA. There's no reason to even for traders to get out. And then you got a new gap along the way there. There was actually a little baby gap. If you take a look in mid April, go back, you'll take a look. You'll, yeah. You're all, yeah, you're there. It was a little baby gap. And look how, not coincidentally, a few weeks later when it sold off, it held above that gap. Mm -hmm. That was a bullish sign. Then you had a breakaway gap a few days later. So th th this is great. And this is why as we hit the tennis balls to them, they're going to start to, which we want to do, inculcate that feel where you see the Picassos, which is separate from just the watercolors. Yeah, perfect. And that little nuance holding the gap that I'm I'm gonna make note of that. So that's perfect. There we go. Right. C CPRT. Okay, let's take a look. Here we go. This actually gave a couple of buys and sells. Here we go. It broke out above its long term moving average way back there in November. Sugar and it also again, not coincidentally, look how it did it on a gap. And this is another thing I'm free associating as we go, but I'm trying to you know, cram as much input as I can into the audience here. A gap when a stock is first moving from stage one into stage two, especially 1B into 2A, 1B is late in the stage one base, 2A is early in the advancing phase, is very, very powerful, very, very bullish. But if a gap after a tremendous move like this, if it has a gap, that's usually what we call an exhaustion gap. And at least from a short term point of view, you have to watch for reversal action. This broke out nicely, early, two way. And also you want to have volume come in, show them how in that November period, the volume started to cluster and build up. It, it was perfect. So life isn't always that perfect, but it was a good one. Perfect. And with so many stocks coming out of stage one right now, how do you pick the best ones? What are some of the things you're looking for, uh, you know, group wise, volume wise, price wise? I the think that, right. I think when you're trying, because you're right, there are so many start with the group. And even, even before getting into the current market environment, I wrote, I remember I book in, a, in the professional tape reader, which I retired <laughs> long ago, but we said we have what we call a forest to the trees approach. You start off with the forest. Is the market okay? 
All right, that's the first box to check. Then the next box is, is it a good group? If you have a really good shot, but it's a crummy group, and you have another really good shot and it's a good group, there's no doubt where I'm going. So the group helps a lot. So that's the second factor. And then the next factor is breaking out on volume, not having a whole lot of overhead resistance nearby, which this did not have. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing, part of the game is volume. You want to see that volume comes in. If volume doesn't come in on the breakout, I automatically you may get a little trade out of it, but I look to get out because those aren't the stocks that have a tiger in the tank. The ones that really, really are exciting have those other boxes we just spoke about checked off. Plus it's got volume coming in, which shows that people are excited to do buying. Perfect. And we can keep going. Uh, let me know if you'd like to jump around to. Yeah, right, down let's down. do one more favorable, Yeah, you know, and, and I'm proud of these, but I think, because the point I want to get across is this incredible, incredible two-way market that we're living. So let's do one more good one, and then let's go to some of the shorts that were. Sounds good. And uh, everybody's got questions about NVIDIA, so let's go ahead and choose this one here. Okay, great. Well, this, this I'm very proud of, but you take a look. One, obviously a great group. Two, you're there. It broke out above prior high there and when was that hey. yeah yeah right you got it right there next look how it didn't even come down this is a sign of a tiger in the tank when it corrected each time it didn't even come back to the moving average the 50-day moving average you know all of these things are little hints it's like we have to be sherlock holmes and when you get these little hints you got to reflect on that say oh that's telling you something um, then take a look, show them in late February how it had an upside gap. Yep, right here. You got it. You're value added there, Rich, as always. Then show them where several days later, when it came to that reaction low, it didn't cover the gap. Mm -hmm. You see? So each of these things mean something. Now take a look and let's look at the recent action where I had clients do some trimming in it. I still like it a lot long term, but this is what I spoke about. Now, first go back and the first, the, the second gap here, but don't go all the way up there. Go to the, the gap that formed right about sheer, right, right off of here up to there. Yeah, okay, you got it. A terrific gap. So that gap is a little late in the move. We have to be a little suspicious. Then show them two days later, another gap. That, again, nobody knows for sure. I can only give you probabilities. That to me is an exhaustion gap. It's late in the move. You don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to know like, hey, it's kind of extended and not just far above the 150 and 200. You're far above the 50 day MA. And now you get a third gap and now look after that upside gap, you had a terrible close on that day. Yep. And look at the volume. You had very heavy volume there. Very concerning short term. Now, long term, I still think it's a fine, fine stock. But to me, again, there's checking the boxes. I trimmed it. And I think that it makes sense. But again, separate your short term trading from long term which after it does digesting, it'll it'll become a good buy again. But this, I certainly don't want to buy it now. But that's a great one. Now let's flip and show people, because we've, we've shown them that, hey, even in this so-called bear market, which I don't think it's a bear market, I think it's a neutral market, but in, in what I call the bull slash bear market neutral that we're in, well, the fundamentalists think we're in an ongoing bear market. We're going to break the October lows and all that stuff. Take a look at some of these stocks and let, you know let's just go through and show them quickly as many as we can look at agilent got killed or one after the other keep going um ash oh yeah let's stay with ashland for a minute i think can you go back to, yeah, there you got it or what was the one before ashland go back one one before elite. no not that one not elite i don't 
There was one before that. Okay, let's first look at Adtran. First, I want to show them how stocks top out. See how going all the way back there, can we compress it a bit? There we go. Yeah, there you go. Look at how first you had back in July of last year, you had that double top, you broke the 50 day MA. Look at how you had a series of lower peaks. Yeah, you know, well, that's one set. Now let's go to the where there was another one in July. In July. Of July of 2022. Yep. July of 2022. Oh, here we go. Sorry, there we go. Ah, there, there, there. I'm First with you. you had the double top. Then you broke the 50 day MA. You quickly went from the penthouse to the outhouse. And even though it came back above the long term MAs, look at how you had a series of lower peaks one, two, three, four. You have so many declining peaks. It's not surprising the stock went to heck. And this was on our sell list, one of many. Let's go forward. Let's look for some more Picassos on the negative side. Ashland, that's another one. We'll go back to the Ashland now before we go to Burlington. The Ashland first, it was an okay stock. Then look at how if you go to December, there, that's going to December 2022. Mm. At that point, it's okay. Then you can see it gives you a little warning. It first broke below the 50-day MA, where I would have taken some off. But at that point, the 50-day MA was still rising, so you don't have to get out of it totally, but you should get rid of some. Then look at how that rally failed well below the prior peak. Then you broke the 50-day MA again. And to me, that's sort of, to use a crude analogy, when you start breaking it repeatedly, it's like a guy or a woman having a heart attack. Each one is a small warning, a warning heart attack. And after a while, we know what happens. And then you see it had you know, more and more distribution going on. And then it had the downside break, whatever. It's very bad. Let's move ahead to the, some more bad charts. Okay, go to the domino. Before I go to Dollar Energy, go to domino. We'll hit this tennis ball to them. Look at how it made a little trace out for them. August and September back in 2022. Show them the head and shoulder top. Left shoulder, head, classic. Right shoulder. Broke below both the 150, 200. The end, of, the rest is, you know, following the script perfectly. Terrible. And, and let, let's just flip some more before we wrap this up. But the bottom line is we're making the point, which I think is very valid. There are good stocks. There are bad stocks. And you could say, oh, that's always true. But it's not as true as it is here that they're so vicious. Like, stay, go back to this one, the one prior. I would just say, yeah, look at that, the NGVT. Look at how, and this is why everybody has to, even my long-term plays, everybody has to have a bit of a trading component in them. Just look at how it looked terrific. Now show them, Rich, in February, how you made that little baby head and shoulder top again. Trace it out for them. Left shoulder, the head, right shoulder. Then, oh, for good luck, gap on the downside. Boom. Then you break 50-day MA. And then later on, you break all the MAs. And then show them that downside gap in late April, early May. So people don't understand this. People are always waiting for the news or the excuse why a stock had a move. The truth is, and it's funny because a lot of times I'll read in the newspaper, the Wall Street Journal, the same news that one week that was used as an excuse why the market went up. Sometimes a week later, they'll use that as an excuse why it went down. Forget the news, okay? It's all supply and demand. And look at that. And there's so many more we can show them, but this is what the market's about. And now I really hope that we've hit a lot of tennis balls. We've really been evaluated. What I'm going to do to try and be more evaluated, we've gone through and we've shown them the theory. Oh, well, let's do one more thing. You, you, this is a, a good shot. Um, a lot of people ask me, because a lot of times I came up with a phrase, 4B minus. 
Let me explain what that means. Stage four stinks. 4B, latent stage four. When I put a minus on it, that's my way of saying it's not a minus at any stage. It's no longer a great of whatever that stage is. A 4B, minus, a 4B that gets a minus is my way of saying, you know what, gang? Even though it's not developed yet to be a stage one, it's not close to being stage two, but it is putting together a very good chance that it's seen the low for the cycle. So if you're short, cover it. And if you want to be a hotshot trader, you can even do some quick trading, but don't live with it. And what has to happen in the 4B minus, it has to have been destroyed. That's great. You're doing a good job. It got destroyed. It has to build a base, at least a baby base. It did. It has to move above the 50-day moving average. It did. And then it has to have, to be a good 4B minus, it has to have room to trot on the upside with no nearby overhead supply. It doesn't. So it fulfills all of what a 4B minus should be. And we've gotten that across. But now what I was starting to say, I've given the best, my voice is starting to go. I've given the best in me, and I really hope you find it helpful. But theory is one thing, actually doing a day-by-day -day basis synergistically helps you grow more. So what I'm going to do, anybody who signs up and takes the course, I'm going to, as a gift, I'm sure my staff is not going to be happy about this, but anybody who signs up, I'm going to give one month as a free gift, the same input that the institutions are getting. Of course, I'm not going to talk to you like I do with the institutions, but I'm going to give you the same. We have daily updates, Monday through Friday, the same five daily updates the institutions get, the same Sunday in-depth weekly report that the institutions get. I'm going to give you free for one month so that you can see this to me will be a learning curve and a learning game. Whereas if one, like I said, we're just showing you things that happen, but now that we've hit tennis balls to you and you've reached the point where you're getting a little bit more proficient and you're not thinking, is it a forehand? There's a backhand you're saying, Hey, that's a good shot. Hey, that's a bad shot. You're starting to react. That's what I want to build up and the feeling you were starting to get it. Now if you come in and take the course, then also getting my input on a day-by-day -day basis for a month, I think it's going to take it a hell of a higher level. So anyway, I've given you the best. I wish you all the best of luck, you know, in this market, which is very challenging, but I think we're all up to the challenge. 100%. And uh, yeah, this, this was one of my favorite projects from last year, getting to work with you. And uh, part of the course is many more chats just like this, going through key concepts uh, that you taught. Uh, and going through a lot of examples as well. And we're about to release a few updates to this course even. So it's a great value right now. Uh, and Stan, to finish things off, just one last question, because I, I know you like this one. If you could give your younger piece, uh, your, your younger self a piece of advice, what would it be when they're getting started with trading? I would think, that, which it took me a while to get, number one, and there's, I guess two parts. Number one, don't try to be perfect. When I first started out, I wanted to be so perfect. And if something didn't work out, got upset. After enough tennis balls were hit to me, I realized, hey, I can return a lot of them. But once in a while, it's going to get by you. So how you handle it, that's very important. Don't try to be perfect. The second thing is be disciplined. And that I quickly got. Be very disciplined. And the third part is don't, you know, don't equivocate. Trust your, your instincts and trust the system. And don't overthink it. That's the advice it took me a while to get. But if I was going back, I would have gotten a quicker giving my younger self when my hair was still black, that advice. Perfect. Well, Stan, it's always a real pleasure chatting with you and going through charts. That's like my favorite thing to do. So uh, hopefully everybody watching got a lot out of that. And uh, I think training your eye is like the best thing you can do and just taking those reps. Uh, and I think that that exercise helped them. So hopefully you enjoyed this. Yeah, go ahead. Right. And let me just say, Rich, we'll end with the words that I used to have in the tape reader. Just remember, the tape tells all. There you go. Perfect. We'll, we'll end it right there. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. If you did, please go ahead and leave a like down below. Uh, subscribe to the channel. Uh, the link to Stan's masterclass is in the chat right now, as well as down below in the description. Definitely check that out. Uh, and we'll be right back and uh, see you guys right here. So.
We'll see you soon. Take care.